Nearly a decade after it was announced, the Flash movie has finally been released to the public. Though looking at the numbers, it would have been better if it wasn't. Between the opening week and box office, the lackluster word of mouth and the immense cost that went into making the movie, we can already call it. This will go down in history as one of the biggest flops of all time. In this postmortem, we'll explore why that is, by first going through these early numbers and reactions, and how the movie's production history makes them so extraordinarily bad. Then we'll look into the additional challenges the movie faced, namely the multiverse, Ezra Miller, and James Gunn, and why he in particular should be worried about this. Going into the weekend, the studio were expecting a domestic opening in the 70 to 75 million dollar range. Allow me to emphasize that this is not the range the studio in any way were happy with, only that this is what their internal tracking figures suggested the movie would open to in North America. However, as the weekend came to a close, estimates for the three day weekend were revised ever downwards, down from 70 to 65, and then down to 60 million, which was reported on Sunday, before being revised even further downwards to 55 million come Monday. That is a bad figure for any high profile superhero movie, but especially for this one. What that opening weekend means is that The Flash had a worse opening weekend than last year's Black Adam. And to put things into context, the moment we adjust for inflation and ticket price hikes, we also see that it had a worse opening weekend than both the first Shazam, Superman Returns, and even Green Lantern. That's right, more tickets were sold for Green Lantern than were sold for The Flash, and Green Lantern was a flop and failed to launch a DC Cinematic Universe. What is especially bad here is the fact that projections were 75 million going into the weekend, which was already bad, while the actual numbers came in closer to 20 than to 10 million below that. That means the movie has bad word of mouth, which is also borne out by a cinema score of B. James Gunn, Stephen King, and all the other celebrity paid influencers who claim this movie was the best thing since sliced bread all lied to you, because it wasn't. Of course, many did enjoy the movie, and that is cool and good for you if you did, but these numbers very clearly suggest that the majority of audiences did not enjoy it enough to return with a new group of friends. The lackluster international numbers are equally signaling worldwide rejection. There are already estimates suggesting the movie could end up losing 300 million, so how could it come to this? Let's see. The Flash was first announced by the Zack Snyder regime in 2014, when it was planned for release in 2018 then featuring a story more similar to the original Flashpoint Paradox storyline from the comics, with Jeffrey Dean Morgan as the murderous Thomas Wayne Batman and Lauren Cohan as the Martha Wayne Joker, and the two were even set up in Batman v Superman to that very end. Why that didn't happen was that when Batman v Superman came out and didn't perform as expected, the studio had a major freakout and were desperate to come up with a new Snyderless direction for DC on film, beginning with massive interference in the already filmed Suicide Squad and still filming Justice League. The interference on those are the stuff of Hollywood legend and we've extensively covered them before. From there on out, DC on film became a revolving door of talent behind both the camera and behind the scenes, as DC went through several different regimes over the next few years, and none were more afflicted by this than the Flash movie. Not only did the many, many teams of writers and directors working on it at different times all have to get paid, adding to the ever-growing cost. By the time the movie eventually was filmed, the most radical regime DC ever had, the Sarnoff and Hamada regime, were in charge. Long-time viewers will know this, because we've been covering it all in real time as it transpired. Just see our DC playlist. And now, yet again, both our reporting and Tom's sources have been validated by the trades.
in a June 17th piece in The Hollywood Reporter, talking about the movie's end Batman twist. They go through the movie's extremely troubled production history, writing, It was also the third ending crafted for the film, which director Andy Muschietti made through three separate regimes at Warner. The Flash serves as a study of a movie that survived and evolved in a rapidly changing media landscape, facing the dictates of several sets of studio heads and a multi-billion dollar acquisition. The Flash, as it was originally conceived and shot by the Sarnoff and Hamad regime, ended on the courthouse steps with Supergirl, played by Sasha Kaye, and Batman, played by Michael Keaton, which Tom reported at the time, who was already featured throughout the movie as a returned Batman. It was meant to highlight that Barry did not reset the timeline as he thought he did. It was an ending that was screen-tested several times, and one that reversed the deaths of Supergirl and Batman earlier in the film. And while that is not stated here, long-time watchers of this channel will know that this was done in order to usher in the DCU. I told you the Sarnoff and Hamada regime were the most radical, because their intention was to use the Flash to usher in the safer, more inclusive and diverse DCU, in which Batman and Superman would both be replaced by Batgirl and Supergirl going forward. With this originally planned ending, Henry Cavill's Superman had already been replaced by Sasha Kaye's Supergirl, while in the direct follow-up to The Flash, Michael Keaton's Batman would mentor his own replacement, Leslie Grace's Batgirl. This was the movie that the subsequent Saslaw regime cancelled while it was filming, deeming it not releasable. The Hollywood Reporter skips over these details, but going back to The Flash and its ending, they do say, The movie got caught in the lightning storm that was Discovery's acquisition of Warner in 2022. Emmerich and Hamada were ousted, and Warner Brothers Discovery CEO David Zaslaw was on the hunt for an executive to run DC. In the meantime, Michael DeLuca and Pamela Abdi were installed as Warner Brothers Pictures Group chairpersons and CEOs. They were tasked with overseeing DC in the meantime, and suddenly, and certainly not unexpectedly, they had their own plans. A new The Flash ending was conceived, and this would be the ending that got rid of the DCU. This new version was still on the courthouse steps, but now Kaye Supergirl was joined by Superman, played by Henry Cavill, now back in existence, and Wonder Woman, played by Gal Gadot. Keaton also remained. DeLuca and Abdi believed they were being strategic with the ending. Cavill was going to cameo for the DC movie Black Adam, and was being teed up to return to the role in a brand new Superman movie. Supergirl was retained, because even though the executives were killing the development of a standalone Supergirl movie, you see there, end of the DCU, they were open to her returning in some form, and didn't want the last image audiences saw of her to be her death at the hands of Sod. What that meant was even more expensive reshoots, as well as another validation for Tom Sources, who reported much of this months before The Hollywood Reporter just confirmed it. But then James Gunn happened, and it all changed again. The Hollywood Reporter writes, In November, Saslaw announced that filmmaker James Gunn and producer Peter Safran were to run DC Studios, overseeing all DC film and television efforts. And suddenly, and certainly not unexpectedly, they had their own plans. Knowing they were resetting the DC universe under their own vision, Gunn and Safran saw that having Cavill and Gadot in the new ending was potentially promising something their plans were not going to deliver. One of the first actions the duo took was to scrap the Cavill Superman film, and they parted ways with Jenkins, effectively killing the third Wonder Woman installment. In other words, Gal Gadot is finished as Wonder Woman as well, consider that trade confirmation. The filmmakers, according to multiple people associated with the movie, then looked for alternatives, but wanted to keep the germ of the idea. Barry Allen thinks all is right, but then has the rug pulled out at the last moment. They also went back to an idea joked about earlier in the filmmaking process. How many Batman can we get? Clooney was brought up as a long shot, but Gunn and Safran jumped on the notion. Beyond the story of how the final ending now in theaters came to be, the point here is that this movie has had several bouts of reshoots, 
some more extensive than others, but all of them added to the total cost of the movie. A cost which, according to our own Tom Connor sources, who in advance revealed both cameos and plot points before anyone else, is considerable. Allegedly, The Flash might in the end have cost Warner more to make than did Joss Whedon's retooling of Justice League. Given that cost, and with the box office figures we're seeing here, that puts The Flash on the path towards becoming one of the biggest flops of all time. But beyond the production trouble, there were a couple of more things that might have contributed to that. The Flash was actually the first of the modern comic book movies to explore the multiverse concept by way of bringing in Michael Keaton. Something Midnight's Edge, by way of Mikey Sutton, were among the first outlets to break was going to happen. But that was three years ago. That was plenty time for Marvel, which has a much faster turnover time, to swoop in and bring the multiverse to the screen first, on both Disney Plus and with Sony to the big screen in Spider-Man No Way Home. More than that, by the time The Flash came out, Marvel had already ran the multiverse concept into the ground. It doesn't matter that The Flash was the first to plan it, by the time the movie was out, the multiverse had already overstayed its welcome, and someone else who had was Ezra Miller himself. Well, actually, we don't need to talk about Ezra Miller that much, as everything he is associated with in the last few years is a violation of the YouTube community guidelines. We know this because we have covered it extensively before, in several videos that ended up being demonetized. So suffice to say that Ezra now comes with a certain level of baggage, and that baggage meant that not only could he not really promote the movie, no one else could either. Not the way the studio would have wanted at any rate, because they all had to be wary and on the alert for questions about Ezra. The box office numbers we're seeing here prove that Ezra was never a draw, to put it mildly, and as I said in my previous editorial, his lack of appeal would not be mitigated by the presence of Michael Keaton. But there is still another person who may have been, in his own way, instrumental to this movie's downfall. As we've already seen, James Gunn's immediate predecessors Pam Abdi and Michael DeLuca intended to re-establish and double down on Henry Cavill, Gal Gadot, and allegedly Ben Affleck for the future of DC, while James Gunn scrapped all of that in favor of something of a joke with George Clooney. Why would he do that? Well, because he's rebooting anyway, that's why, so none of these movies matter, they're already creative dead ends, and Gunn let the world know early, so why bother showing up? The issue, though, is that with every DC movie leaving audiences with a bad taste in their mouth, and Marvel burning the entire comic book movie genre to the ground with their divisive and exclusionary content, how much interest is there going to be in James Gunn's reboot by the time it is ready for release? Only time will tell, but we'll be here to keep you up to date on that and everything else DC. Please smash that like, subscribe and help share this video so you don't miss out on what's next. For now though, let me know your thoughts on The Flash and how it fared in the comments.